coming full circle on, well, right on to 1688, at the settlement of the Glorious Revolution, King James II in 1688 was thrown out by armed force. Um, William of Orange, who had a claim to the throne, he was married to James II's daughter, and she was next in line to the throne. Uh, and they came uh, over, William came over with a smaller army than James. He had about 15,000 men. James's forces numbered about 25,000. And uh, uh, James came to do battle. William landed in Torbay, interestingly, on the 5th of November, uh, 1688. And uh, he then proceeded slowly. Um, he went to Exeter to start with. And James took his forces as far as Salisbury. And uh, there he prevaricated and he became stressed and he got serious nosebleeds. And in, during this period, his chief commander of his army, John Churchill, uh, abandoned him and went over to William, which is what William had been informed would happen. So what William did had the popular support of the country behind it. And indeed, then people rose in the north and they all joined William's uh, troops. And William marched to London, James fled, and William came into power. Now, the way that William came into power is of critical importance because what happened is James uh, fled. William got to London and said, well, look, how do you want to settle affairs? Um, he was worried about this country becoming a Catholic nation at that time. Uh, Louis in France, Louis XIV, had 125,000 men under arms. And uh, fortunately, he had turned south at this time to go down to Austria and uh, have a battle down there. Um, but uh, so William was able to come from Holland with his small force and uh, he was worried about Holland being overrun which was the only Protestant enclave and of course if you know of the Huguenots, the French Protestants who were being thrown out at that time um, and persecuted and they were coming to England um, and it was, religion was about two power bases in Europe at the time in primarily the, the uh, Catholic and the Protestant religion so we were the outpost for the Protestant cause at that time and William wanted to maintain it um, as, so that he could create a bastion uh, against uh, 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 Louis. And he came over, um, he came into London, and he then thought, well, I don't want to be a usurper of power. That wasn't his intention. He wanted a, a settlement that would last. So what he did is he issued an order that the old parliament of King Charles II, which had last assembled in 1685, i.e. it wasn't a, a parliament that had so many placemen in it from James II and had been packing his parliament with his lackeys. So he decided that, uh, that he, they would call the old parliament, plus the aldermen and many uh, burgesses from around, to a big meeting on the 26th of December in uh, 1688. And uh, as I say, James II had fled to France with his wife. So these people met. They decided that there should be an election, and so they immediately held an election, and they sent people round the country. Uh, there was an election, and they f formed a new committee, which was known as the Convention Committee. And this was all done by the 22nd of January. Um, it's very interesting. When you go back in these old dates, um, a lot of you may not know, but the, the calendar was a different system. And the year changed with Easter. In uh, 1688, uh, it was actually the year change from 1688 to 9 was on the 25th of March. Um, so it was centered on the religious uh, point of Easter. And uh, the thing here is that a lot of the time people have got confused about dates because what is in fact January 1688, uh, we would think of as January 1689. Um, so it's, uh, I'll talk about it as 1688-9 and then it will clarify that for you. Um, so we come to January. Um, this convention met, and they assembled on the 12th of... Uh, uh, sorry, on the 22nd of January, and they assembled till the 12th of February. And they decided that James had done principally 13 things in principle that were wrong, and that he'd abused the system and the rule of law, and that there were 13 ways in which they should be put right. And they wrote that up into this important document, the Declaration of Rights, and then they engrossed and enrolled it and put it in the chancery. So in other words, it was, became an official document. And it's probably the only document in the chancery where all the statutes are stored that isn't actually a statute. And what it said was that James had done the things wrong. This is how they should be right. James had fled the country. And because he'd fled the country, the throne was thereby vacant. 
and that they would offer William and Mary the crown under the terms of this contract. And uh, so it says on the bottom of the document, we pray you accept the same accordingly. Um, and this painting that is on the picture here is important because that was a ceremony on the 13th of February um, where Lord Halifax is actually uh, with the crown kneeling in front of William and Mary. And you can see the clerk of the House of Lords reading the Declaration of Rights prior to passing over the crown. So the crown was, became a conditional contract. So when people talk about a constitutionally limited monarchy, it is this scene that actually started to set that whole bit of limitation in place. So the, so the crown was not all powerful. The most important point about this is that what actually happened in this settlement was that it was a victory for the rule of law. And it wasn't a victory for Parliament, as people like to say Parliament, meaning today really the Commons and just about the Lords. Um, but it was a victory for the rule of law to be king or commoner, the law is above you. That is the principle that is enshrined here. And uh, so the revolution of 1688 was a victory for the supremacy of the law and the separation of powers, i.e. The, 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 the Magna Carta business of uh, having trial by jury and so on. Power limited by a contract between the people and the monarch to reaffirm the superiority of the rule of law. It was not a victory for Parliament over the crown uh, or monarchy as it is frequently and usually portrayed um, by many politicians. And this is a vital point because the priority is the rule of law. And the proof of this is very simple. Um, the Declaration of Rights came into being, the crown was handed over, and then the Bill of Rights came into being subsequent to that because what they decided was that because they knew that people would query this whole setup at a later time, that once they got an ordinary parliament, they thought, well, we better make a bill, um, becoming an act of parliament, to include the Declaration of Rights. So if you read the Bill of Rights, what you'll find is that in its text, um, it just has a little paragraph at the top, and it tells you what's happened, and it says, by the way, here is the Declaration, and then you find the whole of the Declaration within the Bill of Rights cited in it. Um, so you can read the Declaration within it, and then there's more added to the Bill of Rights. Um, but the point is that in the Stuart kings claimed absolute power. Um, and that was wrong. Power was never absolute. They had usurped it. And the power that the crown rightly possessed before the Glorious Revolution, it possessed afterwards. And so there was no transfer of power to Parliament. And these words in red of the Bill of Rights make that uh, utterly clear. Um, and it tells you what had happened, and here it is. And to whose princely persons the royal state, crown, and dignity of the said realms, with all honours, styles, titles, regalities, prerogatives, powers, jurisdictions, and authorities to the same belonging and appertaining, are most fully, rightfully, and entirely invested and incorporated, united and annexed. So that's wonderful language, and you can see it doesn't leave much out everything that the crown rightfully had had beforehand, it would have thereafter. The other great change came in the form of the coronation oath. They decided that having got a new king and queen, we must have a coronation oath written down in an act of parliament. And here is that document, and it's probably the most significant document in terms of our, uh, well, the, 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 the being of England and, and Great Britain, the forming of Great Britain uh, from this period. Um, because the world was really changed by the words on this enactment. And what happened is it says, Archbishop or bishop shall say, will you solemnly promise and swear to govern this people of the kingdom of, this kingdom of England and the dominions thereunto belonging according to the statutes in Parliament agreed on and the laws and customs of the same. Now those words in red were not in the old Stuart oath. And so the old Stuart kings had been able to deny that they were bound by the statute law. But now here, very plainly, was an enactment for the oath, which was then subsequently sworn at the coronation, and the statutes in Parliament agreed on were included in the coronation oath. So there was a contract quite plain with the people. And this created a very definitely a constitutionally limited monarchy, bound by the custom, the law and the statute, and of course the oath. And clearly the prerogative power therefore of the crown 
couldn't be used in any way to be in repugnance with the basic and fundamental laws of the kingdom, the kingdoms, the laws in particular, that controlled the use of the crown. The Bill of Rights is one such law. Uh, royal assent is a prerogative of the crown under constitutional restraint. Well, you're beginning to see that, uh, and therefore it is a matter of law and custom. And there are these most important words once again. Uh, it's a great privilege to be able to go to the House of Lords Records Office and find these documents. After all, this was written in uh, 1689 because it was actually April that this was, the coronation was, uh, I think, on the 16th of April, uh, 1689. And uh, to, to be able to find these things and actually look at the original thing is something, you know, really quite special.